auxiliary machines, electrical, steam, hydraulic, compressed air, and other pressurized systems. The machine that use this energy are powerful tools, capable of very hard work. But they are also capable of causing death, injury, and damage if misused. The risks associated with their use are well known. For this reason, their normal operations are strictly controlled by your own national regulations, as well as by company rules. An additional hazard arises when these machines have been switched off for maintenance or repair or are being taken out of service. Why? Because someone could restart one unaware that the machine and its supply system are being worked on. The result can be damage, injury, or even death. In commercial shipping, there is a great need and a legal requirement to employ effective means of isolating machinery while it is being maintained or repaired. Incredible but true, however, some ships today rely only on handwritten pieces of paper loosely attached to the means of energy isolation as a method of enforcing such a major safety measure. This is clearly an inadequate and unacceptable precaution or means of hazard communication. In common with most national regulations in force around the world, if an item of powered equipment has a lockout or other device designed to prevent unintentional activation, such devices must be engaged while any work is being performed on it. The only exception to this rule is if the nature of the work requires the equipment to be activated. Further, an appropriate warning tag must be placed at the point where the equipment connects to the power source and on its control panel. The basic approach is clear. Any equipment that is shut down and isolated from its energy source for the purposes of repair or maintenance must be prevented from being reconnected to its power source while that work is carried out. There are physical preventive methods that can be applied, such as lockout provisions on switches and valves. And there is an administrative prohibition in the form of warning tags placed on the means of isolation. If only chains or ropes are used on valves, these must ensure that the valves are kept securely in the shut position. During the course of this video, we will look at the recommended lockout tagout procedures, the documentation related to their use, and the authorization procedures necessary to ensure maximum safety in applying the lockout tagout systems to electrical equipment, hydraulic motors, steam-driven winches, and compressed air systems. There are occasions when an electrical circuit, for example, is isolated briefly for periodic testing. Having isolated the circuit, the engineer places a tag on the switch, warning that the circuit is isolated, and informing everyone that work is being performed on it. Further, the tag should forbid anyone from reconnecting the circuit. The golden rule is, if you didn't place the tag yourself, you must not remove it. The sanction against ignoring this procedure should be serious disciplinary action followed by retraining. This is the first tier of safety control. The second tier of safety, the physical prevention system, 
is operated when the isolating device is locked in the shut off position with the key removed and a warning tag placed on the device. This is to ensure that the system cannot be reconnected without the active approval of the key holder. The tag in this case informs everyone of the details of the key holder and sometimes the circumstances of the shutdown as well as serving as a warning that the system is being worked on. In the case of a planned maintenance process or of shipyard repair work, a lockout and tagout procedure is determined within the framework of a recognized safety system such as permit to work. The chief engineer and the superintendent will have decided on the necessity of the work to be done and the circumstances in which the work must be carried out. In this context, the lockout and tagout is authorized. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to secure the windlass. Uh, I understand somebody's working on it up here. Okay, uh, you guys are gonna be working up on deck? On deck. In situations where an emergency repair is required due to an unexpected breakdown, the engineer who will carry out the work must discuss it with the chief engineer and the ship's designated safety officer or supervisor and obtain a permit to work by which to control the risks involved. They will check that the proposed lockout will not cause unacceptable operational difficulties elsewhere on board ship. For example, interfering with navigation or with the main propulsion or worse still, the galley. Thanks a lot. If there are no limiting reasons, the permit will be issued and will describe the necessary lockout tagout procedure, the type of lockout devices to be used, and their method of application. This authorization must be obtained before a lockout takes place. familiar with, uh, have you seen these before? No, not these ones exactly. Okay. Just as there are different types of valves, switches, and breakers employed on board ship, there are a number of different types of lockout methods that can be used. The devices may be incorporated in the design of the isolator, or chains and padlocks may be applied. And all of the rest of these give you the option of Fuses or circuit breakers may be removed, or simply a rope may be used to secure a valve in the closed position. Sometimes, if locking or tagging out is not practical, the best form of protection is to trace the lead back to the supply, disconnect it, and take it back to the machinery being serviced. Now, let's illustrate how the system works in particular situations. The right lockout device must be selected for each application and in accordance with the company's safety management system. The number of the lock and its details must be entered into the lockout tagout record sheet. The record sheet identifies the equipment being worked on, the identification numbers of all locking devices and tags used, where they are located, who applied them, and the date of installation. The record sheet is kept in a logbook for signing off when the job for which the lockout tagout was authorized has been completed and the system has been made operational again. A tag, including the name of the person placing the locking device 
and the reason for the isolation must be placed on the lockout device. In all cases, secure the energy source in the off position with a lockout device so that power cannot be accidentally restored. Attach the completed tag to the lockout device. Natalie, we're going to be replacing this transformer here. And, uh... Before starting any work, verify that the right equipment, machinery, or system has been disconnected from all energy sources, isolated, and locked out. Then verify by the appropriate test method that the system is no longer energized. The, uh, machinery lock and tagged out after you've tagged it out. Okay. But always remember that residual or stored energy may remain in some equipment or systems such as capacitors, rotating flywheels, hydraulic pressurized air, gas, steam, or water systems. Such energy must be released or restrained by grounding, repositioning, blocking, or bleeding before work can commence. Remember also that some power systems also act as brakes. So if disconnected, for example, in the case of a hatch cover opening mechanism, you must ensure that the hatch cover is secured in the open position physically being prevented from moving. It is most important to check that the isolated equipment isn't capable of being energized from another power source. If it is, then this power source must also be isolated and verified to be isolated before work can begin. If the secondary isolation takes a different form, such as the removal of fuses, for example, the person isolating the system must retain the fuses and place another tag on the equipment. Safe isolation secure lockout, and the verification of isolation are particularly important in the case of high voltage installations. A crucial variation on the application of the basic lockout system arises when more than one engineer is working on the same equipment. In a shipyard, for example, it often happens that a mechanical engineer an electrical engineer and an electronic engineer wish to work on the same equipment at the same time. It is critical that each engineer places their own lockout device and tag on the isolator to be removed only by themselves after their job has been completed. Similarly, during a shift change, the incoming operator should put his own lockout on the system before the operator leaving the shift removed his. This will ensure that at no time will the isolation be reconnected when the equipment is still being serviced. The record sheets in the logbook provide all the information regarding the multiple lockout to the chief engineer. Work safely completed, the chief engineer must be notified when everything is ready to remove the locks uh -huh. and return the equipment, machinery, okay. or system to normal uh, operation. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and uh, put the power back on it. That'll be fine. Thanks a lot. Now, if it was you who placed the lockout device and tag, you can remove them and re-energize the equipment. 
For effective safety management, it is critical that only the person who placed the lockout device and tag may remove them from a locked out system. Unauthorized removal of any locks or tags is extremely dangerous and must be forbidden. Before reconnecting the equipment, check that it can now be made operational safely. Finally, clear the lockout action by recording completion on the lockout tagout record sheet. This is an effective lockout and tagout system that can be easily operated on board merchant vessels and which will make your work safer and will satisfy the safety requirements prescribed in most national regulations.